Hello everyone and welcome to a War Game Spotlight episode of the Board Game Bunker podcast. My name is Nate and today we will be looking at not only an awesome war game, but also one that could serve as a great intro to get you started in this side of the hobby. That game is France 1944, the Allied Crusade in Europe, designer signature edition by designer Mark Herman and published by Compass Games in 2020. Now, taking a page out of General Dwight D. Eisenhower's speech to the Allied forces right before D-Day about embarking on the Great Crusade to liberate Europe, France 1944 is a low-complexity war game covering the late World War II Western Front campaign between the Western Allies, consisting of the Americans, British, French, Canadian, and Polish forces, and the Germans. The beautiful mounted game map stretches from the French Atlantic coast to the Elbe River in Germany, where the Western Allies historically met up with converging Soviet forces. Now, so that you are aware, while France 1944 is a two-player war game, it does easily play solitaire if that is a consideration for you. Now, the game begins in late July 1944, over a month after D-Day, with the Western Allies seemingly stuck in the bocage or hedgerow terrain of Normandy. As the Western Allied player, you'll have the opportunity to launch Operation Cobra to break out of the Bocage and race across France towards your ultimate goal of penetrating the Siegfried Line and cross the Rhine River into Germany by May 1945. As the German player, your goal is to slow, frustrate, and wreak havoc on Allied plans. While you may not be able to drive the Western Allies into the sea, Though this is a rare possibility in the game, you could grind the Allied armies enough to stabilize the front, prevent an Allied crossing of the Rhine River, and achieve victory. In addition to the overall scope of the game, both players will be able to experience different operations that not only provide some really cool historical details, but also could alter the course of a game. These include Operation Market Garden, the Allied planned to cross the Rhine River through the Netherlands, Operation Plunder Varsity, the largest Allied airborne operation, and the Battle of the Bulge, the German plan to split the British and American armies during the winter of 1944 to 1945. Unlike many other war games on the subject, France 1944 also boasts a number of mechanics that greatly immerses the player into the late war Western Front. First is the game's way of handling army movement, supply, and the operational capabilities of each side through different initiative and reaction phases determined by a random chit draw each turn. For each initiative chit draw, that player can activate headquarters units in, that in turn activate either armored divisions or infantry corps to conduct operations on the map. Additionally, although rather abstracted, the supplies and logistics needed for your units to conduct their operations is determined by each headquarters proximity to a supply source, such as the Normandy beaches at first, but then later deep water ports such as Antwerp and Rotterdam for the Western Allied side, and any German city for the German side. Following each initiative activation, the opposing player has the opportunity to conduct a reaction phase. The game dynamic created by this initiative and reaction mechanic encapsulates not only the ebb and flow of battle, but also simulates really well the logistic constraints faced by both sides throughout the course of the campaign. The second mechanic that greatly enhances its historicity of the game is its combat system, particularly the concept that more firepower in a given fight may not always translate into a resounding victory. Instead, the game captures the essence of late World War II fighting, with the Western Allies having overwhelming superiority in numbers and the amount of firepower it could field, but the Germans taking advantage of the terrain combined with the tenacious attitude that greatly slowed the Allied advance at times. Lastly, the game provides some really cool incentives for the Western Allied player to seize upon opportunities that historically were present, such as the Brittany Campaign and the elimination of several V-1 rocket sites along the northern coast of France. Now, of course, I could keep talking about how awesome this game is, but instead, I really want to take you to the board and walk you through a brief example of play so that you could see how this game functions and whether France 1944 would be an excellent game to add to your collection. All right, so here is the board for France 1944, and as I said in introduction, the game board, uh, only one map, the relatively small footprint for this game, runs from the Atlantic coast of France all the way across to the Siegfried Line, highlighted here in yellow, these yellow hexes, and then the Rhine River into Germany proper. And uh, included in this game is one mounted map of, of uh, France and Germany, as well as a couple of 
player aids for terrain effects charts, as well as we're going to see here in a moment as we do our example play of the different HQs that are involved um, in the game, as well as a really interesting uh, player aid that runs through the whole turn procedure, as well as how to read all of the different counters that are in the game. Uh, also, I really enjoy in this game that Compass provided uh, setup sheets for each player so that they can put the counters on each of these sheets and then know exactly where to put them on the board, as well as later on in the game when reinforcements come onto the board for both the German and the Allied side. Now, you may notice in here that the game begins, as I said in introduction, in late July 1944 with the Allies bogged down in the Bocage Hedgerow country of Normandy and the German uh, Western forces here at least able to contain the Allies at this point. And it may get a little congested at the beginning of the game with multiple stacks of counters. But Compass provided a really, really cool thing where you can actually play out the opening of the game on a separate mounted board of that particular area of the map. The hexes that are here correspond to the hexes that are on the main board. And you can then start the game here and then transfer everything onto the game board as uh, the game begins to, the pieces begin to spread out and you're able to have more room to play. Now what's really cool is not only do you get this map that is a blown up region of that area of the board, but you also get on the reverse the setup for that particular area of the map. And so you can just set up all the pieces right here and begin to play right on this map and then transfer over to the main map. Now, there are two particular player aids that I want to show you before I get into this example play of one for the Allies and one for the Germans that are going to be the centerpiece for each player determining how they are going to strategize and see if they can win the game. So let's go over to those. All right, so here are the player aids that are used by both sides uh, for the game, one for the Western Allies and one for the Germans. And of course, if you're playing solitaire, you can uh, play both sides on the same player aid since they are exactly the same. Um, however, when I play solitaire, I like to use uh, both player aids, for one for each side. Now, before we get into our example of play, I'd like to walk you through a little bit of the information that is available on the player aid, and then we will get into our example. So first off, over here on the left side is the supply point track and then the replacement point track. And I'll explain those in more detail as we get into our example of play. Down here at the bottom is our turn record track running from July 1944 all the way to May 1945, as well as a listing of the different operations uh, and when they can become available throughout the game, including Operation Market Garden, the Battle of the Bulge, and Plunder Varsity. Lastly, down here at the bottom is a listing of all of the uh, replacements and reinforcements that are available through each turn of the game, as well as a listing out of the supply points and replacement points that become available to each side um, throughout each turn, as well as a listing of whether or not the allies will actually have air power uh, for each turn. The last thing I want to show you before we get into our example play is this particular area right here that takes up the majority of the player aid, the movement point expenditure tracks. This may look rather complicated on the surface, but in fact, once you begin to use it, it makes a lot of sense. And it actually shows how this game can simulate late World War II era combat uh, and campaigns very well. So what we have here is we have different tracks that each player is going to be able to pick whenever they start their own initiative phase. So such as maneuver amphibious assault, uh, this is penetration armor attack, armor breakthrough, set piece attack, or combined arms offensive. And what you're going to be able to do in each time you have an initiative phase is decide, okay, do I want to attack? So use this particular marker to say attack or use this marker to say I would rather move. And each increment that you go down, will you can decide what do I want to do? Do I want to attack or do I want to move? And in each of these increments that you choose will then give you the information that you need to determine whether or not 
what forces are available to attack, and how far your forces can actually move uh, if you decide to choose a movement increment. So now let's go to our example of play, back to the board, and begin France 1944. So beginning our example of play here of France 1944, we actually begin on step 8, 8 of 12 steps in total uh, in the turn procedure, because the other steps that are involved, we have already done those um, when it comes to setting up the game. So here on the eighth step, we're going to decide what each player is going to do concerning the number of supply points that they have at the beginning of the game. Now, supply points are points that are going to be determining the number of initiative chits that each player is going to put into the cup, not for this turn, but in fact for the next turn. And this is a part of strategy of how many initiatives does each player want to do for the next turn? Do they want to be more defensive in the next turn? So maybe they would rather save some of their supply points uh, for saving up for, say, a large offensive, say, Operation Market Garden or uh, the Battle of the Bulge uh, for either the Allies or the Germans. In this case, for this example, the Allies begin with four available supply points, and they are going to decide to convert three of them and commit three of them and save one. The Germans here on their player aid, they only have one supply point. So they are in fact going to commit this supply point for the next turn. And so in this case, now what we're gonna do in order to begin the game is the game actually begins with two allied chits already in the cup. And so we're gonna put those in and then we're going to go back to the main board and begin the initiative phase for France 1944. So now that the initiative phase has begun, the allied player is going to pull a chit out of the cup. And of course, it is, in fact, an allied chit. And so now the allies are going to start their initiative phase. The allied player is going to decide to activate the third army HQ. And this HQ is going to tell us how many armored or infantry units that we get to activate through this HQ, as well as it's going to tell us on this particular counter the command range of six, six hexes in which it can command units uh, from itself. And since the Allies have flipped over an American HQ, let me show you real quick on one of these player aids, the Allied HQ command restriction chart. And this tells us that a, an American HQ can command American units as well as French units. So the Allied player is going to grab a number of activation markers. These are provided by Compass as just an optional thing if you would like to use to signify what units are going to be activated. In this case, I'm going to just use these on the stacks that I'm going to be activating to show instead of just one per unit. So I'm going to activate that stack, this stack, and this stack here. And the allied player is intending to attack both this hex and this hex, hopefully to create a hole so that then they can begin to drive out into the French countryside. The allied player then is going to show by flipping these activation markers over where they're going to attack. So now that we have done that, now we're gonna go over to our player aid and we're gonna decide on what increment that we're going to begin this initiative phase. In this case, we're gonna take our movement increment marker and actually flip it over to attack and we're gonna to decide to go down the set piece attack track right here. And what this information is going to tell us as we begin going down this track is in this first box under attack, this is gonna tell us that any unit that has a movement rate of two or more will be able to attack for this part of the increment track. Because we have chosen an attack increment, we do not have to worry about the numbers at the top of this box yet. It is only when you decide to choose a movement increment in which 
you will have to worry about these numbers. But since we're choosing an attack, all we need to know is in this box. Two or more movement rights, they can attack. Now going back to the board here, I have already, before this example, have looked at all of the units that are involved in these stacks and have seen that every single one of them has a movement rate of two or more. In this case, this is the middle number here uh, of six here that every single one has a movement rate of two or more. So all of these units that I'm going to be activating are going to be able to be involved in these attacks. So the first attack that we're going to do in this game is we're going to take the units from this stack as well as some units from this stack and we're going to attack this particular unit. So I'm going to transfer these units to our battle board here and then we will pick up the example from there. So here we are at the combat chart for France 1944 and just looking on the surface of this combat chart it may look in fact quite complicated but let me assure you that once you do a one combat in this game that it will begin to make a lot of sense and you will see that this chart is actually very clear and provides all the information that you need in order to do a combat. So in the, in the game there are two types of combat. There is set piece combat and then there is mobile combat. And we know that this particular attack that we are conducting is a set piece combat because both units, uh, sides of each units are in fact next to one another on the board. And there are other factors that will determine whether or not you could use mobile combat at some point, but that's in the rule book and that's not part of this example here for the moment. So for this combat, the Western Allies, in addition to committing all of these units to the combat, are also going to commit one of their two heavy bomber chits to this particular combat. Like I said, there is only two heavy bomber chits that are available to the Western Allied player. There are tactical bombers that are able to use often throughout the game, but there are only two heavy bomber air chits, and once you use them, they are removed from the game. So it's important to decide what combat that you want to use the this large air power for uh, in this combat. So now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna decide what unit is gonna be our lead unit for the combat. In this case, the Western Allies are going to choose the 6th U.S. Armored Division, and of course there's only one German unit, so he is going to be the lead unit. And now we're going to decide and try to figure out uh, what are the morale modifiers for each side. We can tell what the morale is for each side by looking at the yellow number that is on each uh, particular counter in yellow, so five for the Allies and four for the Germans. I always like to do when I'm figuring out the morale uh, for the total morale for each side is just to use the dice that are provided. So there are four for the Germans and five for the Western Allies, but there are a number of modifiers that will change this. First is the terrain that the combat is being conducted in. And this is in rough terrain. And the, because of the rough terrain, the Western Allies actually lose one morale and the Germans gain one morale. But because the Allies have committed a heavy bomber, this tells us that in fact the Germans will be losing two of their morale for this particular combat. So after going through all of the modifiers, the final result is the allies of four and the germans have three morale next is we're going to roll dice for this combat and the dice that are in this game are really unique of how combat is conducted one is as i mentioned before there's going to be a morale die and each side once they roll is going to try to figure out by looking at the chart here to see whether or not they had a successful attack or successful defend based on their morale die roll, whether or not it is less than or equal to the modified morale of the lead unit, or if they failed, if it got greater than the modified morale. As well as these special dice here, which indicate the amount of damage that each side does to itself, not to the other player, but in fact to itself. So let's roll our die and see what we get. So the Western Allies have rolled a four, 
and a one damage. And the Germans have rolled a three and two damage to itself. So both players have passed their morale and we see looking down this chart that it is a standoff. Now we're going to look through the information that is in this box and it's going to tell us the modifiers and what we're going to do to the final number of hits that each side is going to inflict on itself. So in this case we need to calculate the odds that are in this combat and we're going to add up the numbers that are here on, under S for set piece combat and totaling up the Western Allies there is 27 set piece combat factors and there is seven for the Germans resulting in a three to one ratio. So according to the combat matrix, this results in the attacker's damage, uh, reducing the attacker's damage by one and increasing the defender's damage by one. The net result, however, we have not yet figured out the complete result of this combat because now we also need to look at if there are any modifiers based on the terrain that we're in. And in fact, there are. Because of the rough terrain, the Western Allies have to add one damage and the Germans get to take away one damage. And the final result of this combat is the Western Allies have to inflict one damage upon itself and the Germans have to inflict two damage upon itself. So in this case, the damage has to be taken on the lead unit of each side. So this is the sixth armored division has to take the first damage for the Western Allies and then the 84th Infantry Division for, excuse me, Infantry Corps for the Germans has to take, flip it over for one damage and then it has to take another damage and in this case it's going to take a cadre marker indicating that it now only has one combat factor for both set piece and mobile combat. It is a shattered remnant of itself. So now we're gonna go back to the board and I'm gonna show you where these units are going to move. In this case, the Germans are in fact going to have to retreat because the attack lead modified morale is greater than the defenders lead modified morale. So the Germans are gonna have to retreat from the rough terrain and the Allies are going to have an opening to break through out into the wide open terrain of France. So now that we've transferred our units back onto the main board after we've conducted our combat, now we're going to do pursuit and retreat. So in this case, because the Germans have lost the combat and they are forced to retreat, they have to retreat two hexes. So the German unit is going to retreat first to here, then to here, and then the Allies are going to decide to pursue. In this case, we're going to begin with our infantry units and they're going to go into the hex in which the combat occurred. But both of these infantry units have to stop because they've entered the zone of control of an enemy unit. In this case, zone of control indicates the number of hexes, the hexes that surround this particular unit that is able to project power into those hexes. So these infantry units have to stop once they've entered this hex because the enemy is there. However, the armored units once they enter this hex, they actually can ignore the zone of control of this unit and continue to move forward one more hex. So we're going to move our remaining armored units that were involved in that combat now to this hex. Now once we have finished that, this is actually not the end of this particular attack increment of that set piece attack track that we started out at the beginning of the initiative phase. There's in fact one more combat that we could in fact choose. But I'm gonna forgo that and take you back to the player aid to actually show what we could then do uh, to choose for the next increment. So let's go over here and for this particular track that we're on, let's say that we have finished that combat that was left on the board and now we're gonna go to the next part of the track. And we could choose to do an attack increment. In this case, the only one that is available for an attack increment is in fact this box, because it indicates that a unit with four or more movement factors would be able to attack for this particular increment. Since these boxes are empty, there is no eligibility for attack. 
we could decide to choose a movement increment and we could choose any one of these boxes for that particular increment. Let's say that for the next part that we're going to choose a movement increment and we're actually going to place it in this box. And what these numbers indicate up here is the number of movement points that each unit is going to receive for this particular movement increment. So looking up here, first indicates that if there is a movement rating of two on a particular unit, they can't move. If they have a movement rating of three, they have one movement point. Or if we used what's called an administrative move, when we first started the initiative phase, when we activated our HQ, in this case, we did not choose any of our units to use an administrative movement. Therefore, we can't use the bottom number. But if we did, they would then get two movement points. The same then goes for if there's a, a unit that has a movement factor of four, it can move two or it can move four depending on admin move and then six for four and eight uh, for those units as well. So going back here to the board, this is where we are ending our example of play. I hope that you have enjoyed this brief example play of France 1944. I hope it gives you an idea of how this game plays and how this game functions. Uh, as I said in the introduction, I think that this game models late World War II era uh, campaigns, particularly here on the Western Front, very well uh, in both how it deals with movement and combat and supply and logistics, I think it does a very, very good job of simulating the campaign. Please let us know in the comment section if you've ever played this game uh, or if you have any questions about this game, I'd be more than happy to answer those. Um, but hope you enjoy this example and this overview and spotlight of France 1944, the Allied Crusade in Europe.